Welcome to Together, my name is Johannes Drogaag and I have a very special guest for you today. Edwin Diender, Chief Digital Transformation Officer at Huawei, working at the moment from Bangkok and we're going to have a great conversation about connectivity, about opportunities and when you know me, also about cybersecurity. Welcome back. Today's topic, securely connected once again with Edwin Diender, my fellow countryman. And that's also the reason why I can pronounce his name properly. And he can also, as one of the few people, do it in the other direction. Edwin, um, we talk a lot about, about connectivity. And I am not able to keep up with all those security bulletins, with, with the vulnerabilities that must be patched. Um, and as I always make clear to everybody, it's not just about having the patch, you also have to manage that. Because if a core switch in your network needs to be updated, you basically install some downtime for a big part of the organization, until, unless you have all kinds of expensive redundancies. So it's a big part, it's a big part of my job, and I'm very active with that, but I am not able to keep up with everything. How do you see security in our fast developing connected, uh, connected society? And, and what can people do who do not have this security tick, which I have? Well, I, I, can, I can confess to you that I don't have that tick, um, to be honest. Uh, so I, whatever I'm gonna say now, I'm probably also speaking to myself, I guess. Um, let's. So keeping up, so in your case, with a very strong and a very, and a very high level subject matter expertise in the world of security and safety and cybersecurity, information security specifically, if you're saying that it's already a tough job for you to do this, then just imagine that indeed this is virtually impossible for anybody else who doesn't even have that interest. So the point I'm trying to make on this one, I guess it's with um, openness and transparency of the technology and solutions in place that supports us with all these important items of safety, security, and privacy protection. Uh, but it also sits with assurance, uh, network assurance, the assurance that a network is not down. And if it is down with information within or halfway shared, that that is dealt with in such a way that when the connection is back up again, or when the network is back up again, that at least there is some form of notification that tells both parties where the information is being shared between um, how that's been taken care of. And that sits then again with transparency and openness. Um, assurance on the network, assurances on the connectivity. Even if the network is a bit gibberish, the connection itself can be assured as well. And this is where we of course come from as an organization. We are assuring not only networks to be up and running 24 seven all the time, but also the connectivity of that network. Mm -hmm. uh, the information sharing in between requires mechanisms to provide handshakes and what have you. So assurance, the assurance of software assurance, information assurance, um, systems assurance, I as a user, but also the IT administrator having these systems in place should be assured that, you know, these, these domains and this vocabulary of wording comes with openness and transparency, as I just mentioned. What I do, um, of course, I'm very aware that some parts of the information I share, for example, between my teams or between my peers, or if my director or my manager is talking to me, some parts of that information is highly confidential. Um, we are trying to inform and keep each other aware and inform each other that the information that we're now going to talk about, maybe we should find an other way of doing that rather than, I don't know, the phone call that we're having, where one of us is in a, at a Wi-Fi hotspot, somewhere in the middle of the street or in a park, um, even in the home office. If this is financial information, for example, in some organizations, specifically the ones who are listed, so public organizations, if you work from home and you are the CEO or the CFO of a public listed company, and as you work from home, family members around you are able to walk in and out of your office, your home office, picking up on information that is maybe highly confidential and, and very subject to sensitivity when it comes to share, shareholders and all that. Th that sits with your personal awareness, I think, and with your professional awareness. 
and then there is something with uh, the trust and the transparency and the assurance that even if you don't take care of all of this yourself, you're, you're a blind user, so to speak, or blind, you're deaf and dumb. This is not your business. You're using it and you just, you believe it works and you trust it will be fine. This trust is what you give to organizations and app developers and they shouldn't, and that shouldn't be subject to breach. So when it is, it should be as open and transparent as possible in terms of what exactly happened and why did it happen? Mm -hmm. What do we do about it? How do we compensate this? And how do, we, how do we recover from this? And I think coming back to the point that you made when you started this question, I think it's also very important perhaps for you that if, if it's virtually impossible for you to keep, keep up with all these latest and greatest things in cybersecurity, we should find a way for you and your peers to not have that latency, to, to not have that inability to keep up. We should find ways to keep you able and make you able and have you able to keep up with all this, you know, technology mumbo jumbo because it starts with you guys. I mean, if you guys are already unable to keep up, then w what about the rest of us? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point, Edwin, because um, my, my focus in cybersecurity is mainly on the human factor, on, on the human influence. Um, when, when there is a critical vulnerability and that needs to be patched, I am always there to support all my peers, all my colleagues, all my clients and, and find the best way. But what I am much more interested in are those things like, um, are people even aware of those risks? Are they aware to which extent they are contributing to those risks? And I did, I do that with my team every year. We analyze, we take 1,000, between 500 and, and 1,000 incidents, almost at random, and we analyze those. And we look at what the causes are. And the interesting finding we have for 2019, and, and we'll publish those, um, those, those findings um, uh, briefly uh, or shortly, is almost 90% of the incidents are the result of a human aspect. And that human aspect is not the user in most cases. The user itself is only 9% and still too much, but it's only 9%. The biggest challenge is in configuration and in management of that technology. And I take that and I say, well, that basically means I'm not the only person who is in an overload mode when it comes to all those incidents and how to deal with them. All my peers are in an overload mode. So we then start analyzing why is that? And it's not just the amount we found. It is a wrong understanding of priorities in many cases. It is a lack of collaboration in too many cases. It is, and I, I did a session um, a couple of months ago and Andy Purdy was also speaking there about all the standards implemented and, and I highlighted where those issues are coming from. Right. It's amazing to see that there is a significant chunk and it's almost 23% of abandoned technology, technology which is still in place, but no longer actively managed and no longer actively patched, but it is still there. It's still used. Yeah, and, and, and no one knows what happens if you unplug it. Exactly. There's this famous joke um, and it happened to me once. I'm not gonna share too many details about it because it would be embarrassing. But there is this famous joke, I can ping my surfer, I just don't know where it is. But that is unfortunately still a part of reality in too many organizations. Yes. yes. And, and, and this brings me to my battle cry in the past 10 years at least, and I'm afraid it's going to be my battle cry for the coming 10 years as well. We need to create an environment in which we collaborate, in which there is transparency, in which we put less pressure on the, on the consumer and on the user, but also on the technical organizations and much more address these from the industry that we are. I see some improvements 
and and when I invited you for this interview, I was saying, well, there's not enough. But currently, with all the political development as well, I even see that we stay taking steps back, especially in the field of collaboration and transparency. How do you see that? How, how can we get out of this? Well, there, there's, a, there's a couple of things to, um, to say about this. The first one is that I am not a security expert, um, not by expertise, not by background, not as a role in my company. We have uh, highly skilled and, 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 and capable uh, security experts in our organization, throughout the organization, on every layer, every level, in every team, every department, uh, and what have you. They all look at things in the same way as you do. And they are part of um, standardization bodies, um, nonprofit boards, uh, the global organizations, but also the regional chapters and the local affiliations of all these entities that are working in these domains and that are creating publications and awareness that talk a lot about it. I think coming to your point of collaboration, um, I would, I, would be a, I would be an advocate, I think, for uh, any form of integration of information sharing from different angles, meaning there's many organizations worldwide that have user groups. Probably it would make sense to also have a user group specifically for and dedicated to uh, the domain that we're, or the topic that we're now talking about, which is about safety and security um, and secure connectivity and what have you. Uh, probably in that same respect, it also makes sense to have an ability to filter all kind of information that's been brought in versus all kind of information that's then been pulled out. Because the principle of garbage in, garbage out for databases and for uh, data analytics also applies to information and therefore to information security and therefore to uh, secure connectivity. If there is more people adding their concerns Mm -hmm. then it will probably not be very efficient if this is all kinds of information that doesn't get filtered and that doesn't get um, pre-staged, so to speak. And it needs to be able to be audited uh, because what we assess today in an audit today is because of the views that we have today. And the views that we have today is a result of what we learned yesterday. It says nothing about tomorrow because tomorrow hasn't come yet. Um, it doesn't mean that tomorrow does not exist. Tomorrow does exist and you can change it actually. You can change tomorrow. It's a very simple thing. Uh, if we agree that we will do something tomorrow and we put that in our calendar, then you and I are start to prepare in our social networks and our private networks, in our contacts, in the, in the things we do and in the information around us to make sure that whatever we agreed upon to do tomorrow will happen tomorrow. So if one of us, maybe two hours later or three hours later, then we decided that to change it. So I already now can make an agreement with you and in my mind, I can agree with myself that four hours later, I will tell you something else. So you need to change for tomorrow. I am making changes to tomorrow. I am having a huge impact on, on you, on, on whatever you had in mind for tomorrow, but not only for you, but everybody that you informed mm -hmm. about you doing this and not being able to do that. You know, so th there is an influence on this. And this influence, I guess, from an assessment point of view is not easy to be audited. So the audit mechanisms of today can only audit what comes out as input from yesterday. So sometimes we also need to improve the audit. We need to, so maybe tomorrow we need to audit differently. Because the information from today is provided slightly differently or it is slightly different form of information. And what I see and where I'm coming to with this analogy or with this metaphor, or with this storytelling is, of course, it's with standardizations. Everything that is so standardized at some point becomes so rigid that it is a fixed information silo, impossible to move. And the only thing it can do, it can look internally. It can look inside. And it doesn't matter how many virtual windows you bring in, but it is an, it is an inside looking, impossible to move stovepipe. If we're able to make things more horizontal, more overlay, more leveraging, if we can uplift a foundation, so to speak, or create a foundation that can pull up pieces of yesterday and today, but on top of which we can move something forward that makes 
an easier change for tomorrow and the day thereafter without changing the technology itself. For government services, you could say it would be great if we have a nationwide infrastructure that is always there regardless who is the president-elect or regardless of who is the public administration or if you want to put it more popular, regardless of who is in office. Because whoever is in office, this is the foundation that they can build further upon and they can leverage from. Exactly. And I think that requires, as you correctly put, uh, collaboration. And I think we should have this more with transparency and openness than we have today. And probably that will not improve. Probably that will not improve. But what it will do, it gives us more insight to optimize. Exactly. Exactly. This is, this is my point as well. Um, with, with transparency and, and collaboration, we create a much bigger focus on what matters. We are capable of, of, of benefiting from each other's, um, each other's strength and we would be able to support the others with their weaknesses. Um, I always love to use this example. I, I had the privilege, it was truly a privilege, of, of almost 20 years ago being at a symposium about security where Eugene Kaspersky was having a very passionate speech about how much time we could win if we just start sharing information about virus threats. And 20 years ago, viruses and malware were the big thing. And he wasn't asking everybody, the competitors, to share how they solve it. He was just pleading to start sharing the threat information. It took almost two decades. And now we finally understood, well, guys, it's a good idea when we share threat information. And the result of that is that all of us are much better in dealing with those threats. But what I truly appreciate is how you bring in the auditing uh, concept. Because for a lot of corporations and organizations, passing the audit is a major goal. And we analyzed that as well. And we found, and, and it's a bit shocking, but I have to share it uh, nevertheless. We found that 82% of the companies with significant cybersecurity issues during 2019 were compliant with their own cybersecurity policies. We also find that each of those companies which had passed the compliance test for security and nevertheless had a significant incident, all had policies which were at least five years old. Now, nothing of what I knew five years ago, and I am, I am proud of my work and I express what I contribute. So I am here and now saying, I'm, I'm rather good at my work. And nothing of what I knew five years ago about threats and about solutions is valid today. So how is, is a policy which is five years old or more helping my organization to have the right attitude and actions for today's threats and tomorrow's threats, right? Nobody heard about ransomware five years ago. Just one example. Yeah, yeah it is, it is. And I think the other part sits, you know, sometimes technology goes faster. So the development of technology goes faster than the ability to implement and the other way around. But again, coming to my earlier point, if there is not a verticalized, not a silo um, approach, but if there is more like a horizontal layer, if there is a foundation that allows us to leverage, that allows us to overlay and that allows us to integrate and makes possible for systems and services to be interoperable and to coexist, then probably the element of collaboration becomes slightly easier. So the the ability for information sharing across teams and departments and anonymizing specific parts of data first would be a feature of that infrastructure rather than a function of a system siloed, of a siloed system. Probably that makes more sense. And, and from, 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 from a way forward point of view, I think it's also more efficient to have it like that. It's similar to, uh, uh, I, I come from the east of Holland and uh, a couple of years ago, there was a bypass created around the city where I live 
so um, commuters and travelers didn't have to go through the town but could go mm -hmm. around and this road has become what they call a death road the amount of accidents since the road is in place is, is terrible but the amount of fatal accidents is just as terrible each accident is terrible but the fact that people also die about it is even more terrible and rather than well, let's make it very black and white. Rather than coming to the conclusion that we need to overlay this road, perhaps with a wider one, with a more secure one, with a better manageable and a better approachable one, where the entrance to this highway and the exits to these highways are easier to put in place and to close off as well. For example, for emergency response units versus what happens now is where do most accidents happen? When do most accidents happen? Well, they happen between six in the evening and eight in the evening when the sun sets a little low and blinds people from the north to the south or the other way around. Okay, then let's create larger um, road signs that blocks the sun, for example. Or let's, let's make the exit less um, sharp and more curvy or more linear or, or, or well, let's make a roundabout and you go around two or three times first before you actually enter the, uh, the highway or exit it. It's just, you know, it's, 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 it's bandages. It's bandages. It's, 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 um, it's a little cloth. It's a handkerchief to make sure the bleeding doesn't get worse. Exactly. Um, Symptoms, not the causes. Right, and there's money going in place and it does it, it does it. It does it for, two weeks or four weeks, and then the next accident happens. It's not looking at the bigger picture. It's not dealing with the issue. It's, it's trying to solve um, a short-term part. It's not looking at the road and saying, this road is not a correct road. We should change the road and not features of the road. Adding an extra barrier, you know, creating traffic lights that has green zones or not. Uh, you know, lane shifting. It's, it's all focusing on one small piece. It's trying to make a project with technology. And perhaps it also means it tries to make technology look good in, in smart cities and in intelligent cities and connected cities initiatives. This is often what you see. It's a project for smart parking. And now we are a smart city. And wow, does technology look good? And I was the one who did it. So please elect me again for the next term, kind of. I don't see that scaling very much. Technology goes faster, yes, than the ability for us to implement, but we have to implement technology in such a way that it sticks with us, regardless of who's in office and regardless who's next, because it makes the handover much easier. Definitely, definitely. And it, it also supports society when, when technology and infrastructure is built for that society and not for whatever agenda is, is important at that moment. And I think that's a, that's a, very, good, uh, that's a very good point. Yeah, it also, sits with this, with, 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 it also sits with the question you ask yourself when you start. The, the question for this road example that I just give, perhaps could be, uh, but maybe, there, maybe everyone is asking everybody, how can we make sure that accidents don't happen? That could be a question. But perhaps another question could be, how can, create a, how can we create a safer, a safer road for a more smoother throughput or, or, or other questions. And it's, it seems like sometimes questions are being asked from one angle and doesn't involve all the other angles. And this comes back to the earlier point of openness and transparency and awareness that we talked about and the collaboration part. There's a lot of bright ideas that only come to the table if people look at it with a brighter mindset. So if you keep sharing your ideas with the people you always share your ideas with, Basically, what Einstein said, uh, if you do what you always do, you get what you already have. So if you share the ideas that are there with everybody who already are there, then you get the outcome and the, and the assessment of those ideas in the same order as you already have them. And, and you're just creating an echo chamber. It's right. And if, you're, if, 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 if no one is asking questions in the room because everybody agrees in the room, then probably you're in the wrong room. Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's, that's the thing that we see in a lot of areas. We, we see, um, I've, I've witnessed it at a, at a factory in, uh, where, where there were some changes made to the infrastructure of the factory. It wasn't perfect. 
um, and and then the, the company went on a trace of, of almost two years making rather costly investment in correcting and improving those changes. And at one point I got the feeling that the sole purpose is to prove that they were right instead of having an open view, bringing in the proper experts and, and look at what needs to be done to solve the issues with these changes in infrastructure. Um, after two and a half years, Yes, there, there were some, some um, other leaders in place and they basically did the same thing in the opposite direction. Instead of saying, okay, we made this change, we made this investment, now let's have a look at it and see what needs to be modified. They went on, a, on an agenda of proving that the, the, the project by the predecessor were, were wrong. So they invested their energy in that. I went back to that same facility five years later and it was still in the state of, of a bad change to the infrastructure. But now at least everybody agreed that it was a bad change to the infrastructure. What have you achieved? Absolutely nothing. And, and we see that too much, that there is a wrong focus, that, that agendas are more important than the actual value, as you, as you mentioned. And that's bad. And that, that also has impact on our connectivity, that has, has impact on on security that has impact on the trust as an industry we hand over to the consumers who become more and more dependent on the services and the products that we offer. Well, yeah, as we said before, it sits with the assurance and the insurance. You know, if someone ensures you that systems and services are secure, then you have to be, as a consumer, feel assured that this is the case. And also your rights have to be part of the protection goes along with it. Exactly. Um, you cannot expect everybody to be an expert in everything. Um, so if, and, and, and we started this conversation with you saying that you were unable to keep up with all the cybersecurity bulletins that are out there. Uh, you know, if, if, and as we said, if, if, if that's already virtually impossible for you to do, then how can you expect a consumer who is not even in this game, not even in this space to do so? There has to be other mechanisms where a consumer has to be able to rely on and that's it with trust and transparency and openness as we talked about and the assurance and that they can be ensured and assured that these mechanisms are in place and they can look at them and they can find them out for themselves they can test them mm -hmm. they can maybe even assess them for themselves and what would be great is in terms of collaboration as you mentioned if they're able to talk back and say i've looked at this and it either i don't get it or i looked at it and it doesn't fit or I looked at it and it doesn't do what you assured me it should do. So now what? These kind of, um, these kind of questions makes it perfectly right to have an inclusive society. Digital inclusion, I think, goes hand in hand with secure connectivity. I think, I think we now mentioned the favorite topic of our mutual friend, uh, Deborah Rue, who is um, an advocate for inclusion, an advocate for accessibility. Um, yeah. And, and that is one of the things we all want to achieve and we are all responsible for, of course. Digital inclusion is not focusing on the people who can afford the latest greatest in technology, who will buy a new mobile phone because they want to have the latest greatest. Digital inclusion is about everybody. Also, those people who need a little bit assistance or who need, need a little bit more attention. But right. they are a member of our society. And as Deborah Rue says it, I'll be dead and roll over before I allow them to be excluded, right? Yeah. So if, we, if we change our attitude and become an industry that focuses on inclusion, that focuses on trust, that focuses on ensuring that anybody and everybody can use the technology in a safe manner, that is when we start to achieve security we start to achieve fully agree access. fully agree fully agree and i'm a i'm a i'm a strong um um what is it advocate i'm i'm really very much in favor of of, of the way how deborah rue and her organization are are bringing this to the table and not only advocating about it and creating the awareness but talking with very tangible and pragmatic ways of implementations and solutions for technology that's already there 
for example, towards the organization that I represent, there has been tremendous amount of inputs from her in our organization on how certain features on our smartphone, if we would change it a little, so we don't change the smartphone, we just change the capability of it or the usability of it, would not only fit the majority of those who can use it, but specifically the minority of those who should be able to use it but are excluded from it. And that makes perfect sense. And in addition, there are so many accessory organizations who are providing uh, components and pieces and parts that you can click or that you can add or that you can fo fold around your mobile device. And I'm not only talking about the, uh, uh, th these additional battery packs that you can put your phone in and then it has an extra uh, battery pack, but the way these battery packs are shaped or the additional function that such a battery pack has to better fit uh, the hand of someone who doesn't have a hand that looks like yours and mine, but who has a hand that is slightly, uh, well, that is formed a little different. Uh, we still call that a hand, but the hand is in, has another form or functions in a different way. So how to, how to make that work and how to, how to do that. It's fantastic, fantastic. Voice commands, voice controls, uh, gestures, even AI enablement where the camera of a smartphone can look at specific features in your eye and in the way you look at it, and your tone of voice to understand that you perform in a certain way is, is magnificent, magnificent and applaudable, very applaudable. We should have more people following Deborah Rue, I'd say. Def definitely, Deborah, Deborah Rue is for me this wonderful example of a person who's not only capable of addressing a challenge or a problem or a very, very significant issue. She is there with solutions and she yes. is there with a very open ear to everybody who wants to contribute, who everybody who wants to criticize. And, and yeah. she filters all that and brings that into, and, and with her team as well, um, Richard Streitz is an example. I adore that man with his, with his concept of always taking things by design. And, and clear. Deborah Quite clear. brings you you ask her one question and she gives you 10 possible uh, points of input and, and she brings solutions to the table and she gets back to you about what, what you discussed. I'm a huge fan of Deborah. I'm, if anybody is not yet following Deborah, please do so. Also look at her show Human Potential at Work. Totally. Perfect. Is, I guess this is where we should say follow the link in the, in the screen yes, below. So I, I will definitely put it, put it down click here. here. Click right. here or follow that link. Or yeah, exactly. Rue Global, Deborah Rue, that's the place to be if you want to understand uh, inclusion, accessibility, and totally. what it will take. Secure included connectivity. That should be the topic of this part actually. Secured included connectivity. Exactly. My mission for this year um, and I'm working very, I'm, I'm very happy and very proud and very grateful for the coaching and input by Deborah. My mission for this year, my personal goal is how can we bring cybersecurity, accessibility, inclusion together in a solution platform and a solution portfolio that does make sure that everybody can use technology in a secure and included manner without include excluding anyone it's a tough one it's 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 i think totally. so far the biggest personal goal i've set ever and i'm far from from coming up with solution so it might flow over into the next year i look, I I look forward to following uh, i look forward to follow the achievements of that tech tech for all tech for all, all. yes but also trusting tech that's also an important part and if i i, I try to make this personal by, by very simple, I need reading glasses for basically everything. I have my notes on this interview and I have to put them at 150%, otherwise I cannot read them, right? So I then think, but well, what if that gets worse? Because five years ago, I only needed reading glasses for the very small print, which we never read anyway. Now I already need reading glasses to just look at my phone. And, and my personal joke is, well, my eyes are not getting worse. My arms are not long enough, but I need reading glasses. Oh, and both I sense, are physical. Both is physical. <laughs> and I sense that it's getting worse. So what if that spiral continues and just reading something, 
becomes a challenge, more and more a challenge. How can I still use technology where apparently I am responsible for reading all those things about what should I update and what should I patch and when and what is critical and not and where can I click on and not. And it's just a simple thing like reading glasses. Now take that and project it to all the other parts. And, and your wonderful example, when your hand is just shaped differently, that doesn't make you a, a, not a person or a less person or you're still a human being, just your hand is shaped differently. And how does that impact your ability to use technology, but also your ability to use technology in a safe way? And we take that in all, we can take it in all kinds of directions. And as yeah, an I agree, industry, I agree. I, agree. And and I, I, think, I think a counter, I think a counter yeah. view on this one is the way you talk about it, it's still from the person with the hand that is shaped differently from yours and mine. We can also turn that around. So if I'm a device manufacturer, I, I need to look at all the different hand shapes that are out there. And I need to make sure that it fits all these different hand shapes. And it, it, and, and, and it matches the way these hand shapes works and these, these different shaped hands uh, move or, or are in, able to do so um, and provide alternatives for, for the same usage. Because that would also be inclusive, right? Exactly. And, and we can start with a simple example. I'm now a right-handed person because I was born as a left-handed person, but as soon as I go to school, that was not okay because it was different. So I'm a right-handed person, but I'm also a left-handed person. And the interesting split is the things I do by nature, I prefer my left hand. The things I've learned through life, I prefer with my right hand. Okay. Just using certain devices with my left hand is still a challenge because we focus on no, the right I have, hand. I have similar. It goes, it, 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 it flows, it flows. It just depends which one is available, my left hand or my right hand. It doesn't. My right hand is not doing things because of experience and my left hand because I was born in a certain way or whatever, or there's a preference. It, it, goes, it goes a bit on what's convenient. For example, eating with chopsticks. It depends on where, on where the bowl is that I need to get the food from. If it's on my left side, I use chopsticks on my left hand. If it's on the right side, I use a chopstick on my right hand. If I'm behind my computer and if I'm writing things, it depends where my pen and my notebook are. And that, and that determines whether I'm writing left looking at the screen and then going on with my right hand where perhaps my phone is because I need to answer messages on my phone or, or the other way around. It just depends on, on convenience almost. But, but good examples, yeah. So secure, inclusive connectivity is how we are renaming this particular topic. That sounds yeah. cool. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> So I think it's a perfect wrap up, uh, Edwin, of what we discussed. And as always, I truly appreciate all your in, your insights and your views and, and your different perspectives. Um, I appreciate how you shared it with us. I'm, I'm, I hope that the audience uh, will enjoy that as well. I um, hope so too. So thank you again for your time, Edwin. We will definitely uh, hook up again pretty soon and, and re record our next sessions. We have a lot of topics to cover. And today's topic, the new title, Secure Inclusive Technology. I think that's the mission goal for all of us.